Thanks, cheers. Hi there. My name is Bradley, and welcome to Sums Up, a channel about how to survive in the online. Oh. Right, uh, should we try that again? Hello, my name is Bradley, and welcome to Sums Up, a channel about how to survive in the online jungle. Um, excuse me, could you help me? My phone's broken, I really need to call my little sister. She's around here somewhere, but could I use your phone for a minute, maybe? Of course. Not. But why would I reject such a polite request from someone so lovely? Well, the truth is, even such a small token of chivalry can have massive implications when it comes to the loss of your money, your time, and even your freedom. Today, I'm actually going to demonstrate how dangerous it can be to let your phone fall into the wrong hands. Admit it, you're probably quite protective of your phone. On average, we actually touch our smartphone screen 70 to 150 times per day. Something like low battery, slow internet, or no Wi-Fi. This can all cause some serious problems in the current day and age. You might have heard of this term, nomophobia. Well, it's the fear of being left without a phone. And many people actually suffer from it. God, please help me. I promise I'll be a good person. I'll, I'll be nice to my mom. I'll, I'll, I'll quit vaping. I'll go to church. In fact, statistics suggest that this fear grips 50 to 70% of Europe's inhabitants. If seeing your phone battery dwindling down to empty gives you angst, you may need to see a doctor. Now, because of this, we can easily empathize with somebody who's lost their phone, or maybe they can't access it. But it's this empathy that scammers are able to take advantage of. Can you help me? My, my phone's broken and I really need to call my little sister. Yeah, sure. Let me just unlock it for you. One second. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. So my innate British chivalry has just played a cruel joke on me. I didn't ask this girl for the number she wanted to call, but rather I just gave her an unlocked smartphone. It doesn't really bother me that she might be calling a premium number that'll cost me an arm and a leg. And this is because most mobile operators actually have been allowing users to block paid numbers like 1900 for almost a decade. And it wouldn't work calling Mexico or India from my phone. I've already blocked those numbers long ago. And therefore, I'm not really afraid of the more ancient variants of fraud. But take a closer look at what our girl is doing. Before dialing a regular phone number, she enters some additional numbers and asterisks. Now these are called USSD commands. They're there to basically manage the services of the mobile operator. It's a bit like sending an SMS, only they allow fewer characters and they're free. Specifically, this command could be used to forward calls from my number to another phone. And scammers use this technique when they want to intercept important calls. Imagine that you've got a small online store and customers frequently call you and give their, say, bank details over the phone. I mean, a scammer could quite easily intercept such a call. And you can also bypass two-factor authentication this way. Some services don't send SMSs, but rather ask you to enter the last digits of the phone number that called you. And finally, my bank actually allows me to find out the current balance of my account using these very USSD commands. A couple of seconds and the girl knows whether I'm rich or not. Not bad, right? Now, it's pretty easy to protect yourself against such situations. Just make sure to ask them for the number, dial it in yourself, and then lock the screen. I recommend actually finding out in advance which USSD commands your operator supports. It's nice when someone asks for your phone number after a first date, but you're quite unlikely to give it out to a person that you've just met. At least, I really hope so. The mobile phone number has actually become a universal identifier. It's connected to, say, our Google accounts, our Facebook accounts, and also our WhatsApp profiles. We now use a phone to verify our identity more often than, say, we use a social security number or a national insurance number, maybe a driver's license or a passport. It's that much more valuable. And because of this, your personal data has long been a marketable commodity on the darknet. But why buy something that you can get for free without even asking directly for it? Look, our charming fraudster is just calling her own phone. That's all. But she has my number in her hands. And in a few seconds, she can find out my full name, my address, information about my parents. You just need to enter a number onto a site like White Pages. This data is enough to bypass outdated verification systems, for example, to answer security questions for password recovery. In addition, for serious attacks, scammers can actually use SIM swaps. 
They contact the mobile operator on your behalf and report the phone missing or stolen. And at their request, the operator issues a new SIM card with the same number. The scam is usually quickly uncovered, but a few hours is all it takes to hack into an account on, say, Twitter or Instagram. And that's actually how, in 2019, hackers managed to get into the account of Jack Dorsey, the co-founder and CEO of Twitter. Excuse me. Excuse me. Does anybody here have a phone I can borrow? I need to log into my Twitter account and my phone is dead. Please? All right, thanks anyways. To reduce the likelihood of such an attack, I'll always try not to disclose my phone number in such situations. If I need to call, say, an unfamiliar number, well, I'll use the familiar USSD commands to disguise my number. If you enter this combination before the call, your number will remain hidden. Unfortunately, the service command doesn't actually erase logs from the mobile operator. It actually only hides the number from other subscribers. And the criminals, well, they're well aware of this. And therefore, they often try to use the phones of random people to communicate with accomplices. Let's eavesdrop on what the girl who borrowed my phone actually said. Hi, it's Emily. Yeah. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. As usual? No, not today. Um, how about we meet at four at Piccadilly Circus? Now, it's a pretty generic conversation, right? There's certainly nothing criminal going on there. Well, maybe think again. Let's listen to the recording of that conversation. Hi, it's Emily. Yeah. Aha, yeah. As usual. We have fresh heroin in stock. Would you like a free sample? No, not today. For a shot. Where can I find you? Um, how about we meet at four at Piccadilly Circus? You'll be assisting in a crime simply by doing a small favour to a stranger. Now, if you still decide to allow someone to make a call from your phone. Put the call on speaker and feel free to listen into the conversation. If you have even the slightest suspicion of the legality of what is happening, turn off your phone. Now, of course, it's quite rude to listen into someone's conversation, but at least you don't have to worry about spending money on lawyers later down the line. Asking to call someone is often just an excuse to get your hands on a, another person's phone. And in this case, lock screen patterns help scammers the most. This is the most unreliable authorization method. Lock screen patterns have turned out to be just as predictable as simple passwords. According to the Mark Logue study, the average key consists of only five nodes. Three out of four people start drawing the key from the corners of the screen, and the general direction of the movement is usually from top to bottom and from left to right. It's easy to see how a person moves their fingers all over the screen than to see the individual letters they're typing in for a password. And even if you have a long, strong password or a biometric authorization method, you're still not safe. Scammers take advantage of the fact that humans do not multitask very well. Now, this trick is based on an unexpected event that will distract attention from an unlocked smartphone. Hang on, 07542. <laughs> No, you have got to be kidding me. Now, it's unlikely that this kind of turmoil will last for longer than a minute. But even so, during that time, you can do a lot. Our charming fraudster, first of all, opened the Photos app. Strange? Not at all. Banking applications require additional authorization, so there's no need to waste time there. Moreover, text documents take a long time to read and analyze, even if you only read the headings. But useful photos can be found even with a quick swipe. And here, the attackers are interested in, well, at least two different things. The most obvious and delicate thing, well, it's your private photos. Now, even if you're not a Hollywood star, you could easily be blackmailed with sensitive photos. But much more dangerous are pictures of another kind. Photos with passwords, those associated with your company's internal network, your home router or network storage. Passwords that are too long to remember and we rarely use, so we prefer to keep them 
at hand on our phone because we're not going to remember them off by heart, right? And photos of documents, passports and bank cards are often stored here too. Do you remember how much information I got from that laptop that I bought on eBay? Well, there's much more information stored on a smartphone nowadays. This is the fastest course of action for the criminal. Attackers will not even forward what they found over the network. It's easier to just take a picture with their broken phone. A few seconds later, it's done. Protection from such actions is obvious. Just don't keep sensitive information on your phone. I know you have that copy of your passport on your phone. Delete it now. <laughs>Imagine that the attacker has just a couple of minutes more. Let's say that the girl managed to buy time by slipping me some drugs into my coffee, but what can be done with that extra time? Smart scammers will not make large purchases to a fake address or change passwords to social network profiles, right? All of this will take too much time, and it's also very unreliable. I'd have time to cancel the order form from the store, and it'd also be very easy to restore access to all of my social networks. So what will criminals do? Well, the truth is, a lot of them will be trying to infect your smartphone with malware, and the choice here is enormous. These may be programs that intercept the passwords to applications, Others will be able to give attackers full access to your smartphone remotely via the internet. And depending on the targets, invisible spies can record all of your conversations or track all of your movements in real time. Now, the installation of such programs takes just a few minutes. And the most common way they do this is when the attacker sends an SMS to the number of his uh, accomplice. And in response, he gets a message with a direct download link to the desired program. A couple of clicks and you're done. You can go to a safe place and slowly dig up the secrets of your conquered mobile phone. Now, criminals can safely plan blackmail, withdraw all the money from your account, or intercept all traffic from social networks, and you're none the wiser. For them, there's no need to hurry, either. What can you do about this? Well, certain signs can actually give away the work of malware, and you need to be aware of them. For example, noticeably increased internet traffic, right? fast battery discharge, and maybe the phone's high temperature when it's just on the desk, maybe on standby. Now, if you notice any of these symptoms, back up your data, reset the phone to its factory settings, and then carefully, step-by-step, -step, install only the really necessary applications. You'll also be surprised how much more space will be added, even if you didn't have any spyware installed in the first place. And now let's talk about another type of crime. Even if you really have nothing to hide, criminals can still be out for you. Now this is quite scary. Up to this point, we've been talking mainly about what can be stolen from you. Your money, your identity, access rights to a protected resource. But so far, we've not said a single word about another very real threat the creation of fake and compromising material. Perhaps some fake nude material, or maybe faking your involvement in a crime. That is not mine, that is Nietzsche's. Now this threat is usually greatly underestimated by not only ordinary people, but also experts in the field of cybersecurity. I think this is due to mainly stereotypical thinking. I mean, in ordinary life, forging convincing evidence is never an easy task. In the digital reality, it's quite the opposite. Editing a picture or even making a fake video, well, that's not difficult at all. So we're already pretty used to doubting the digital evidence. Remember, one of my first videos was actually dedicated to the creation of such deep fakes. It's really interesting, so check it out after the video. But now we're faced with the creation of new types of compromising material. And we're going to have to fight them in a new way. Imagine that among, I don't know, 300 apps on your phone, there's one that can cost you your money, your freedom, and your reputation. What's that? It could be a messaging app or a client of an unpopular social network that you don't use anymore. It doesn't matter which one it is, it just matters that you don't use it anymore. Now, attackers will actually use such forgotten means of communication to simulate illegal activity, to correspond on your behalf with fake accounts about the resale of drugs, the production of pornography, or forged documents. Now, one day, you may find that you've indicated the accordance to drug careers several times or harassed minors with obscene offers, all seeming to come from your phone. Now, the whole point of such a crime is to fabricate convincing traces 
and then the hackers will demand money for their silence. A difficult option is to try to copy your digital fingerprints, the traces that your phone or computer leaves behind, but it's much easier to actually use your device. And therefore, if you've got a new acquaintance who regularly shows interest in your phone, check the list of recently used applications. An unpleasant surprise might be waiting for you. I just gotta Google something real quick. Sure. Wait, what did I last Google? Did I type, uh, I don't know, dog dicks for some reason? Dog dicks? Thanks, here you go. Yep, sure, no problem. I just wanted to Google dog dicks real quick. Now, usually at the end of a video, I repeat the most important things and I give five or six tips regarding online safety. I won't have to waste many words today as I've only got one piece of advice. Never give your smartphone to other people. You wouldn't give a random person your credit card, the keys to your safe or your passport, would you? If they ask politely. So why aren't you afraid to let them hold something that encompasses all of those things, your smartphone? Technology nowadays is developing so fast, much faster actually than our habits are changing. And these habits are things being taken advantage of by experienced scammers. Your job is to keep up with them, think and always look for pitfalls. Remember, technology simplifies our lives, sure, but we have to pay for comfort with increased security. Anyway, my name is Bradley. And my name is Emily. And I'd like to offer my overt gratitude for your open-hearted Olympian odyssey on our unorthodox omnibus of the Ogres Online Swamp. We'll see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.